He has also served as the senior presidential advisor to His Excellency, the President of Uganda on ICT and investment matters. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from Makere University and a Master's of Science in Computing and Information Systems from the University of Greenwich, UK. Thank you very much, Mr. Msinguzi, for joining us. You can say hello to the viewers. Uh, thank you, Mildred. Uh, dear listeners, and colleagues, um, my fellow panelists, good evening, everyone. Good evening to you, and we hope to listen to the figures because many are awaiting that at a later stage. Our next panelist is... Mercy Kainobisho is the Registrar General of the Uganda Registration Services Bureau, URSB, appointed in December 2020. Before that, she was the Director of Intellectual Property. At URSB, Kainobisho has served as the Manager, Directorate of Intellectual Property and Director, Business Registration. Before joining URSB, she served as State Attorney at the Department of the Registrar General at the Ministry of Justice and Constitutional Affairs. Ms. Kainobisho, High Court of Uganda with 15 years of experience specializing in intellectual property law, business law, project management, oil and gas law, leadership and general management. She holds a Master of Laws in Intellectual Property, LLM, from the University of Turin in Italy, a Master of Business Administration, MBA, from Makere University, a Postgraduate Diploma in Legal Practice Law Development Center, LDC, and a Bachelor of Laws Degree, LLB, from Makere University, Kampala, Uganda. Masi also has more than 17 research articles and publications under her name in local and international journals and Because for you to operate a business, it should be lawfully registered. It should be operating lawfully. If not, it will definitely be closed down. So it's no wonder you had a lot of law in the profile of Ms. Kenobisho. It's a pleasure having you. Say hello to our viewers. Thank you, uh, Mildred. Uh, to our viewers, I greet you all. Uh, please uh, have a, a good uh, evening as you watch us in your homes and everywhere you are. Thank you very much. Thank you too for coming, hoping to get lots of answers. The questions are already streaming on uh, online. And uh, of course, the president always talks about Uganda being a private sector-led economy. And we always ask ourselves, where is the place of the private sector in the economy of Uganda? And what is the environment in which the private, uh, private sector is actually pl uh, playing? And tonight, we are delighted to have uh, the deputy executive director of the Private Sector Foundation Uganda, none other than Mr. Francis Kisirinya. Mr. Francis Kisirinya, it's a pleasure having you say hello, uh, say hello to our viewers. Thanks very much, Mildred. UG Spotlight viewers, uh, good evening. And uh, good evening to my fellow panelists, and I look forward to a very good discussion tonight. Strategically located in between the two, <laughs> the Registrar General uh, of URSB and the uh, Commissioner General of Uganda Revenue Authority. Let's start off the show. Of course, before any business starts, the first thought is registering it, getting a name, getting a location, but all that has to be done lawfully. And the organization to pay attention to is the Uganda Registration Services Bureau. Probably many of um, the Ugandans get to know you because they need to register uh, their businesses or even marriages uh, themselves. But uh, to a Ugandan out there, could you briefly uh, let us in on your mandate as URSB? Thank you, uh, Mildred. Uganda Registration Services Bureau is uh, an institution of government that is charged with registration of business names, our companies, our documents, uh, which include uh, contracts, affidavits, certificate declarations. Uh, URSB does register intellectual property that includes uh, trademarks, uh, service marks, patents, utility models, technovations, industrial designs, geographical indications, traditional knowledge, <laughs> copyright, mm. and the other special mandate that we have is uh, the insolvency and receivership, we're in charge of business rescue, we uh, register civil marriages, we license places of worship, we give uh, uh, or issue single status letters for those that intend to get married, we uh, give special licenses, 
And the other mandate that we have is uh, we uh, maintain the security in movable property register that provides for registration of uh, your movable property for uh, it to uh, be used as uh, collateral to access uh, finances from lenders, including banks or uh, financial institutions. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, how far would you uh, say you have uh, worked towards achieving this mandate, looking at the environment of the people you are serving, of course, the customers, mm -hmm. the reception, and the understanding of your mandate as URSB? Yes, uh, URSB is a key player in the business envir environment. And uh, uh, according to the World Bank, uh, the URSB uh, affects um, three key uh, indicators, which is uh, the starting of a business in Uganda, the ins resolving insolvency, and uh, access to credit. And those are key uh, indicators as far as the business environment is concerned. And so uh, URSB... Um, uh, has uh, an impact in as far as the ease of doing business is concerned to attract investment in Uganda or in any country or in any economy. Oh, there are many considerations that are made and the business environment is one key uh, consideration which is dictated or has a correlation with the political environment, the economic environment, the social environment, the legal uh, infrastructure, ICT uh, and among others. So as Uganda Registration Services Bureau, we have uh, eased the doing of business by addressing some of the bottlenecks that affect uh, the registration processes. Mm. And these include the time it takes to register business, the cost of doing business, uh, the processes, the people that are behind these processes because sometimes uh, institutions uh, forget the human capital development and yet this is... Uh, the area that uh, uh, is very key to moving uh, these uh, reforms that we have. And uh, th there's a wave in many economies in Africa of uh, business reforms. When you look at uh, many countries in Africa and beyond, we have been doing a lot of reforms to simplify the registration processes in as far as the business environment is concerned. But also, uh, we're not looking at the entry uh, point of businesses, we are looking at business sustainability, a business continuity, and we encourage whoever registers these businesses or their businesses to uh, put in place corporate governance uh, uh, frameworks to uh, sustain their businesses. But when businesses fail or are about to fail, we are also here as URSB to enable them to uh, uh, have business continuity by uh, putting in place uh, business rescue mechanisms. Some businesses fail because of simple things like uh, failure to record uh, uh, businesses, failure to register because we have a big informal sector, failure to, to, to get the, the right skills or attract the right skills, or right skills on board, and, uh, and, and lack of uh, access to, to, to credit. And we have simplified this by putting a pla in place a law, the Security and Movable Property uh, Act of 2019, which provides uh, for access to credit using the movable property. So it is possible for a business to, to use its car, to use its crops, to mm. use its movable yeah. assets, computers, to access loans from lenders, and these are financial institutions in a structured uh, okay. way. Okay, we'll be delving deeper into that because when you talk about uh, being able to access loans, many people are looking at land as, as, as security to, to that loan. But we'll be getting deeper into that. Let's now come to the tax collector, the taxman that every Ugandan thinks twice about, uh, Commissioner General, the mandate of Uganda Revenue Authority uh, to Ugandans out there. Some people confuse a bit of things. That is why they keep on asking, where is our money going, forgetting that probably when you collect that money, it is taken somewhere else. Thank you, Mildred. Uganda Revenue Authority was set up by an act of parliament in 1991. And the mandate was to collect revenue, to manage uh, to administer revenue, to handle all the processes that relate to that, to enforce the laws that uh, relate to revenue, 
and to handle any other issues uh, or other related matters. So that is our mandate. In simple terms, we are the government body that is responsible for collecting revenue that run the nation. And after the revenue is collected, that's the question that comes next. Now, once the revenue is collected, it is passed on to the Treasury. The National Treasury is the one that handles the money. Ours is to collect and pass on. Mm. And then Parliament appropriates that money and then it is spent for goods or services that government provides to the citizens. Okay. Mm. Well, uh, we'll be digging deeper into this particular one because there is an advisory role as well you play to the Ministry of Finance. But at a later stage, uh, Mr. Ksirinya, the Private Sector Foundation of Uganda, someone out there probably is hearing it for the first time, but even those who have had it for a long time ask themselves, what is it about? How do I join PSFU? Is it a body where um, just a few are supposed to be belonging? Just expound much more about PSFU and its mandate and what it does. The, yeah, the Private Sector Foundation was founded in 1995 uh, by a tripartite and an agreement between the government, donors, and the private sector at that time. The reason why we are founded is that um, uh, after uh, the government taking the liberalization route, many businesses became private. And uh, in doing business, they needed to engage with the government to agree and uh, harmonize uh, policy positions. So that we didn't have any body or association that could bring down or bring together the businesses to discuss their issues, build a common position, and then represent them to, to government. In fact, that time, we used to have, oh, just like today, so many sector associations, and each of them would actually move to government with their own interests without actually harmonizing them to find out which are, are those interests that are common to the uh, Ugandans at that time. So it was decided that uh, an institution like ours, Private Sector Foundation, be established. So we are a membership organization. We have about 180 associations, about 70 corporate bodies, and about... 12 government agencies that support our work. Now, everybody who does business in Uganda, I should say, is a member of PSFU, either directly or indirectly, because the associations we have, the manufacturers, the insurers, the bankers, the farmers, all of them have members behind them. So those members, we believe, are, are our members. So for us as PSFU, uh, over the years, we've uh, studied uh, the economic environment, the business environment, and our mandate is actually threefold. The first one is to ensure that we represent the business people to in policy decisions that government is actually making. We move out every so often to the business community, find out what they think about certain policies. Uh, we harmonize those policies and represent them to government. Uh, policies to do with, the, for instance, uh, taxes, with the uh, registering business, and many others in the legal and regulatory environment. We also uh, uh, have decided now to move into what we call business development. We are very sure that many of our businesses, um, the, the policy environment is fairly better today, but that is not enough to guarantee their success and be able to, to pay taxes. So we move in and identify what are those specific issues that are within the control of the businesses, where we can actually intervene and ensure that they are able to address them and trade better, compete better, make money, survive, grow the economy, and also employ our people. So that is something else that we do, and we do it uh, very well, I should say. Many of you must have had, if you're a business person, an engagement with us, either through a support which you are working on with you, or indirectly, your supplier and whoever you are working with or an employee in terms of upskilling them and things like that. So that is what we do as private sector foundation. Okay. Well, yeah, continue. Now, we as a country, I think I should say that um, uh, we are lucky in a way 
uh, we've been battered very seriously by, by COVID, not, not ourselves only, but many others. But we also had another, another challenge of uh, dealing with the, the, the elections every five years. Of course, these always come with their own challenges. But we are, I must say, we are happy as private sector foundation that we have seen these two animals uh, not actually affecting the business environment fundamentally in the perspective of issues to do with macroeconomic stability. Every investor, every business person would like to operate in a business environment where there is a stable economic environment. Inflation is controlled, exchange rates are okay, and uh, they, are, they are able to predict how their businesses will actually operate. So we have seen over the last few uh, weeks, our economy, much as it's rank because of COVID, it is starting to pick up, it's growing again, and the inflation is uh, controlled within the five percentage points, and a number of things are actually starting to show up. So we must actually commend uh, my colleagues here, URSB, and the URA mm -hmm. for the effort that they're actually putting in this economy, for the attention. And they have been reforming for a very, very, very long time, and we commend them for accepting to reform. That is why we have an economy that is fairly okay. Not very good, as we would have wanted, mm -hmm. but we could have been worse because of COVID and so many things. Okay, well, and, and, and it's that particular point I wanted to pay attention to, uh, starting with you, um, Mr. Msinguzi. The aspect of COVID-19, of course we are still in the COVID-19 pandemic, not yet, uh, we do not yet know uh, when we will finally be declared COVID-free as a, a country, but also as a world. How has this impacted on your business of revenue collection? Um, certainly, as uh, Francis has indicated, COVID-19 impacted businesses. It impacted incomes. It affected jobs. And uh, because revenue is a fraction or a percentage of income, when the economy is impacted, definitely revenue suffers. So we are all grappling with the impact of COVID-19 in revenue collection. As you know, during the month of total lockdown, mm. maybe from around April uh, until when there was a bit of release uh, towards July, uh, there was literally no businesses, shops closed. Mm. But again, uh, to appreciate the wisdom of our leaders in this country, a window for manufacturing was maintained. So the only business that was coming through uh, revenue was raw materials for industries. Um, and that kept some life in the economy, but also the jobs of those factories that continued to work uh, kept returning some revenue. So definitely, uh, the lockdown months were very bad. We were collecting only a fraction of what we should have been collecting. But from the time when there was partial uh, release, uh, then we started to see the economy peaking. So as my colleague has indicated, every time the economy is peaking, then the revenue also peaks. The two go together. You cannot collect revenue when the economy is not doing well. And again, on our side of collection, we had to come in with a flexible uh, means of collecting revenue, the little revenue that could be collected. Mm. So we, we extended filing dates, the dates when you file in your returns, when you submit your returns to URA. We extended payment dates. We uh, allowed payment of taxes in installments. We extended the warehousing periods to allow people who had imported goods and were in the warehouses and had no money to clear them. So we allowed a uh, longer warehousing period and clearing as and when they have capacities. Uh, we expedited the processing and payment of refunds to the taxpayers as to bring some liquidity 
and so on and so forth. There's a lot of adjustment that we had to do just to ensure that the revenue collection, you know, can keep on. What can be collected is collected. And of course, what cannot uh, is deferred for another time. Okay. Th that has been the experience from the revenue collection side. So do we say we have slumped, we are somewhere in between, or we are actually steadily moving? Because we are already in the budgeting process. We have a few months to end this financial year, which badly hit us with COVID-19. Mm. And whereas Ugandans will complain about the taxman, at the end of the day, we depend on you to collect taxes. The new targets that have been set so far, you are doing 47% uh, of uh, the taxes collected to support the budget. And even if our tax to GDP ratio mm. is still about 13%, low on average with regard maybe to sub-Saharan, but at least we are there. So what is our truck? How would you rate us economically with regard to tax collection in such a pandemic year? Well, there's, uh, there's, there's certainly the reality that some jobs have gone because of the COVID impact. Sure. So that directly affects our payee return. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is reality that some businesses have closed. Sure. So not only do we uh, miss the income tax that they were contributing, we also cannot get the VAT they were, they were, they were collecting. So those are realities that are affecting our revenue collections. And um, as you know, businesses are resilient. There is always an effort to harm on and push on until when you can't push anymore. So even when the infection rates of COVID are going down, the actual impact of COVID is being realized more on the side of the economy now. Okay. There are people who have tried to push on and on and on. I'm sure you see the adverts in the papers every day. People are selling schools and so on and so forth. They've tried to hang on for many uh, months, but then they can't push it any further. So when that reality sets in, it gets us thinking as the body mandated to collect revenue to look at new sources of revenue. Mm. Now, the point you just referred to of the tax to GDP ratio being at 13, that's quite low by all standards. Mm. But it also points to the fact that the the, 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 the economy, the GDP is much bigger and the collection is much smaller. It points out to a fact that there is something that can be done on our tax register. We can bring in a few more players that have not been there. We can also look at our tax base. Maybe there are other areas that earn an income and do not contribute some tax. Mm. So whereas being at the bottom of the tax to GDP ratio is a disadvantage. But in the COVID era, it is an opportunity. It is some work for us to think outside the box and look at new areas and new opportunities of expanding the tax base and of expanding our tax register. And that is what we are trying to do, to collect a little more from areas that we are not collecting in, to be able to meet the expectation. As you've rightly indicated, out of a national budget uh, uh, of about 45 trillion, we are given only 47%, which is about 21.6 trillion to collect in this financial year. We are working hard at it, and uh, we are very optimistic. We still have some gap to cover in this mm -hmm. remaining uh, quarter. We are now in the last quarter of the year and uh, we are doing the best that we can. We are optimistic and we hope we, especially with the support of every taxpayer, we can collect the 21.6 trillion. Uh, and if we don't get there, we still have tried our best. So we are, we are thinking out of the box to see how we can collect revenue to fill the gap that we've been given. 47 is small enough. So if we fail to raise the 47, uh, then the government is being pushed in a more difficult position 
because it means they had already prepared to borrow the 53. If we don't raise the 57, they must fill that gap with additional mm. borrowing. Mm. And that is something that we'd want to avoid as tax collectors. And I'm sure even as taxpayers, as citizens, we, we, we don't benefit so much from debt. We are better off using our resources to, to develop our nation. Well, thank you very much. This is the point where it feels like a preacher preaching a message that is directed to you, mm -hmm. that we complain about how much government is borrowing, but the question is, how much is uh, the person that you are next to that business doing or yourself doing mm -hmm. uh, to pay the taxes that at the end of the day will get used uh, to bring on the services that we saw Yan to uh, get in the country? But we'll be getting uh, back to you, uh, CG, in just a bit. Uh, to um, um, to Masi, um the aspect of COVID-19 and business registration, and I know there is a bit of non-tax revenue that comes through the Uganda Registration Services Bureau. How has it been for you in a COVID-19 year? And we are still faced with the pandemic, of course. Uh, thank you, uh, Mildred. Yes, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic caused uh, a lot of disruption in many institutions, if not all, and in all sectors. And it was unexpected, the impact was unexpected, was unknown. But when we faced the lockdown, we were lucky that we had put our systems in place, electronic systems in place for registration. Okay. And there's no, not even a day that URSB stopped operating online. What we did, we had to shift our offices to our homes, we had to work online, remote working, for the staff that did not have laptops, they had to get laptops or computer workstations in their homes to give that business continuity because of the essential services that we provide in terms of business facilitation. And uh, the online systems enabled applications to be made through an email, examinations to be made, uh, payments to be made through the mobile money or visa or banks and registration certificates to be issued. That is how well we fared. But from the uh, business cycles, of course, because of the, the shock that was caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, some businesses came to a halt and we could feel them because we can tell from the business continuity, the registration of, of our resolutions, the registration of annual returns and other post-registration requirements. Um, but there was also this opportunity that was, as a result of COVID, many businesses shifted their area of concentration. We saw a lot of businesses going into the manufacturing sector, manufacturing sanitizers, masks, and all the uh, uh, items that support uh, the uh, prevention over the COVID-19 pandemic. With regard to business registration, we saw a number of businesses being registered because many people were at home and they had nothing to do. And that is when they remembered, oh, I can run a side hustle. Okay. The side hustle mentality came up. Mm. And which fits in with the household incomes that the president always promotes, that at least every household should have a business that supports them, that supplements their incomes. And so we saw many businesses, families, creating businesses and registering them online. But the, the other issue is that we saw a lot of creativity and innovation in as far as intellectual property is concerned. We saw a lot of music coming up. We were enjoying uh, the, the NBS music shows because we were being entertained in our houses. But this music was being made within the studios uh, in, by these musicians. <laughs> We saw a lot of people writing books, and these are literary works that are protected and intellectual property. We saw a lot of patents coming up and utility models being protected. A lot of people registered their security in movable property. What was more affected as far as our services are concerned was marriage registration, because there's no provision for online marriages. <laughs> there's no legal provision for online marriages. Okay. So it came to a standstill, but we could provide data because we are data 
center of all registered information, we could re provide data, certified documents on, on regarding uh, our marriages and, and licensed places of worship. With regard to the non-tax revenue uh, collections, uh, as you know, the law mandates us to collect on behalf of URA, we are agents of URA. The financial year 2019-2020, we collected 56.6 billion. 2019-2020. When it came to 2020-2020, we saw a shift. Uh, 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 approximately now we are at around 41 billion. Our target for this financial is 47 billion. And we believe that in the next two months, uh, the 7 billion will be raised. We are this confident. We provided the mobile registration uh, services. We provided all the platforms for access to our data in as far as our registration is concerned. So yes, the COVID-19 pandemic caused dis disruption, but it also brought a lot of opportunities that now entities know that you can stay home and work from home and deliver results and meet the targets. We know that within the houses and the households, people can come up with businesses, create businesses, create many innovations, become innovative, even when other businesses were affected. And so, um, as Uganda Registration Services Bureau, we have felt the shift in the uh, business cycles, but again, we saw a lot of opportunities in as far as registration of intellectual property. In fact, intellectual property registrations performed much better than the last financial year because we registered more creative uh, products, uh, the music, the uh, trademarks, the logos. People would bake cakes and label them. People would uh, uh, bake mandas who came up with different products within their homes. And others actually did not go back to their workspaces. COVID-19 pandemic gave them the opportunity to create businesses that have prospered and there was no use of going back to a salary job when they can make uh, incomes, when they can make their, their money. Okay. Uh, the other issue is uh, that uh, we provided for online um, journals, online information, we, uh, magazines, we shared. As, as institutions, we have collaborative uh, networks uh, between uh, URA, local government, uh, city authorities, and we had to leverage even on the tax register expansion uh, project that we have had since 2014. So there was a lot of opportunities even when COVID-19 was not good. At the moment, gotten used to the new normal. Mm. We have gotten used to uh, registering online. Uh, but of course, we still have to deal with the mindsets. The people who have to say, if I don't come physically, I will not feel that the documents have been registered. Yeah. But we also have to operate a dual uh, system because not everybody has access to the internet. Not everybody has access to online registrations. And so we have that provision for walking clients within our regional offices, within our trip centers, mm -hmm. even within our headquarters okay. at Uganda Registration Services Bureau. And even during the COVID-19 pandemic, our building that we are setting up in Kololo uh, moved so fast that uh, we are entering it in uh, June this year. And so there was a lot of uh, time to also concentrate on the infrastructure development since that was not uh, locked down, among okay. other things. Well, it seemed to be a good year for you as URSB, so to say, to a greater percentage. Uh, but also, while you were talking about businesses that started off uh, from home, I was thinking, are they registered? Are they formalizing? Are they paying taxes? That's the next thought that was coming to me because we need uh, this money. And we also want to say uh, a special thank you to uh, the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance that is enabling uh, the Spotlight UG to come to pass and that Ugandans get to know what's happening in the different ministries, departments, and agencies. Coming to the private sector foundation, you are mandated, like you said earlier on, uh, with studying economic environment, and we are talking COVID, COVID, COVID throughout. What has changed, what has remained constant, and what do we hope for to become better uh, with the economic environment within which the private sector um, is operating? Mildred and viewers, I'll tell you. Um, what has changed and what we need to actually appreciate is that uh, uh, COVID gave us a chance 
as Ugandans to come together to respond to the biggest challenges of, of this time. Uh, when COVID struck, very clearly with the lockdowns, with everything, almost nobody knew what would happen next. And uh, we are so grateful that when we engaged uh, with government, with the various agencies, uh, we are able, or government was able to come up with some relief packages that helped us uh, during that time. For instance, the reliefs, or probably the deferrals on taxes, uh, the moratoriums on paying loans in banks, uh, NSSF, uh, to ease our cash flows and we, we traded. But what, is, what came out also very seriously is that uh, we started seeing a lot of our markets being affected. Yes, everybody started looking inwards, especially in the region. The trade was no longer as free as, as it used to be. We know very well that the southwestern border, there was a challenge, but we also started getting challenges on the eastern border. Now, this is creating a very big challenge in the industry and manufacturing and doing business and the businesses that are opening up. I'll tell you today that much as we open uh, our businesses, we can only utilize about 30% of our capacity. What it means that if I'm able to do uh, 100 loaves of bread a day, I can only sell 30 of them. So mm. the rest, I'm not <coughs> able to sell them. So this is impacting uh, the businesses and their rate at which they can grow. Now, what is the challenge that is bringing that? Our assessment is, we think, as private sector, that the, our markets have narrowed. Our consumers have not much disposable income to mm. actually spend because of what has happened. Some have got uh, salary adjustments lower. Others have been uh, retrenched. Others, the businesses are not working very well. And all these demands that have come through now, what do we have to do to get to the businesses, to get to the next level? This, is, this was my call, and it's a lesson that uh, we actually are, are talking about. The lesson is we need to partner. We need to partner just like we partnered as government and the private sector mm -hmm. to respond to COVID. You remember very well as private sector, when government called, we came up, uh, came up with the solutions, innovated for sanitizers, for masks and for all those preventive items. We even got into our, our, our pockets and donated resources to government so that we respond. Now we have responded. Mm. Now the next thing is how do we recover? So recovery is going to require us to look at how we expand our markets. There is no second way around it. How do we make sure that that uh, employee who is to earn a million shillings and is now earning 500, is able to purchase goods so that we can lift our markets, our, our production capacities from 30%, probably to 50%, which was pre-COVID. This is how we are going to be able to recover and grow our businesses and grow the economy. So we feel uh, at Private Sector Foundation that we need initiatives, we need partnerships with the government on what we should be doing now. Should we keep more of the money we are making so that we can buy more goods and services to create market for our industries? Mm -hmm. Or should we give the money to, to government to spend on, on our behalf? I think the question is uh, for policymakers to really decide who will be best able to utilize these resources better for the uh, good of the economy. Okay. But we believe that partnership is necessary. Let's sit together, let's work on uh, policies, Let's agree on tax rates, which are not going to take away even the little uh, demand that we have. And it, by doing so, it stresses uh, the consumption, in which case yeah, factories and businesses uh, reduce growth. What about in other services that uh, we have, like uh, uh, URSB is saying? Is there any ways that businesses can actually be supported to register even when they don't have resources right now. How can we do it? Because in the end, we would like after a few years, one or two years, we need to have to come back with a very robust economy mm -hmm. that is able to grow and develop and grow the, 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 the tax base that we need. So what are those things we need to partner on so that we are able 
to rebuild this economy to the level that we want. I think for us that is the biggest lesson we've, we've actually uh, learned. Mm. We also have learned that um, uh, th there is ingenuity, there is uh, innovation among Ugandans. How do we promote that? What do we have to do to promote innovation? People moved out on their own as Mass has just done it. What if we put some support? What if we facilitated <coughs> them? What would we, what would we be able to see? Okay. So these are things that we need to do. The use of ICTs is now very important in businesses. How do we make sure that more and more people can access ICTs to utilize the online platforms that URSB is using, that URA is using, that we are also using to access our customers. Okay. So those are the things we have seen. They are the lessons, they are the changes we see in the economy. And uh, we hope if we take the lessons very well, we should be able to build back better. That's very true, and we look forward to that. We are very optimistic. Uh, coming to you, uh, Mr. Msinguzi, um, while, while Mr. Ksirinya was speaking, you talked about growing a tax base, and you clearly indicated um, that according to the statistics of URA, mm. the monies are coming through, they're growing bigger, but the tax to GDP ratio mm. is where the problem is. It, it, it's not growing in tandem with the monies that are coming through. And, and what's clear, like you mentioned, is that probably some of the businesses there are not paying their taxes. They're not formalized. Mm. Our informal sector being at 52% and a Ugandan out there is asking, why should I even personally continue paying taxes, mm. carry on with my obligation with all these statistics that are coming through? Mm. Thank you, uh, Mildred, and uh, my colleague panelists. Thank you for, uh, for those comments. Now, <clears throat> I think at the start I mentioned that uh, taxes are just a fraction of the income. So excited to hear... Uh, my colleague uh, from uh, Uganda Registration Services Bureau talk about companies that came up during the lockdown. Uh, that, is, that, that, is, that is exciting because it means these companies, uh, when they grow and survive, they will start contributing to tax in the near future. Mm. We are not going to run after them now and say, <laughs> please start contributing tax. We will only tax when they have started making an income. Yeah. And again, uh, what uh, my colleague uh, from the Private Sector Foundation mentioned, uh, the, the, the entrepreneurial spirit of Ugandans <coughs> came out clearly during the lockdown. That is uh, another positive thing that we celebrate as URA, because true... Ugandans are very enterprising. And therefore, it is in our interest that we work together now, as Francis has said, and encourage and, and promote these businesses so that they can grow to a level when they can start contributing to, to, towards tax. Now, fortunately, again for us, is that Uganda is a very rich country. God has given us almost everything we need. But our biggest strength is in agriculture. Now, if we sit and look at the import bill of the things that we import, which we can grow here, <clears throat> it, is, it is astonishing mm. for things like wheat, the bread that we eat on a daily. Mm -hmm. We spend about 600 billion Uganda shillings importing wheat every year. Uh, for things like rice that we grow here, we spend again hundreds of billions uh, to import rice. In other words, this COVID checker, which uh, helped us to be a bit inward looking, we should extend this discussion to see how can we import substitute? How can we leave money in this economy to grow our businesses and our industries and produce what we consume here and probably even have an excess to sell out? That is just on the side of agriculture. But how about all the other imports that we do? Textiles, steel, all these, there is capacity to do them here. So I think this discussion is healthy. 
as Uganda Revenue Authority, and I'm happy that you mentioned uh, one of our roles, which was, uh, uh, I think, mentioned uh, uh, not in so much detail, is to advise. One of the uh, uh, our uh, stipulated role is to advise the Minister of Finance on policy issues. So as long as we can engage with the private sector and we listen to each other, we will be shooting in the same direction in lobbying for the right policy measures so that we encourage more production here, more uh, import substitution, more growth of our economy. That will give us strength and resilience. So I'm, I'm excited to hear these things coming out from both my colleagues. It is a promise that the Uganda's economy has much potential. It is still a virgin economy, many, many opportunities that we can take on and move forward. Okay. Uh, many times uh, <coughs> you are given a target as Uganda Revenue Authority every time we're having the budget read out and uh, you have worked so hard to ensure that you hit your target many times. Mm. But the questions that many Ugandans remain with are, do my taxes work? Do I have a reason to continue waking up in the morning and pay these taxes? Yeah, thanks, Mildred. I think that's a question that uh, many Ugandans could be asking. But at the same time, I think in Uganda we have very glaring and clear reasons uh, to show that our taxes work. Let me explain them as basic as they sound. Okay. Um, government entirely relies on revenue collected internally or loans acquired uh, to, to give us services, goods and services. So the first service would be education. I know for sure, as a citizen, that we have a government school almost in every parish of this country, built by government and educating the Ugandan children for free universal primary education. I know for a fact that we have almost in every sub-county of Uganda a secondary school built with government funds and educating the students of that sub-county for free. And so on and so forth, up to tertiary institutions and universities. So education as a service, payment of teachers, construction of these is done by government from revenue. The same applies to water. I don't have the statistics of water coverage, but I'm sure every Ugandan who has access to safe water was delivered to the doorstep by government. Everybody who is connected to power is a service that is delivered by government. Yes, after the connection, you start to pay for usage, but mm. laying that infrastructure right from the dam, we had years of blackout of load shedding. Now that it's no more, where has this come from? Government had to invest billions and trillions of shillings into hydro power construction, into evacuation of that power, into its distribution up to your doorstep for you to be able to connect. So services like power, like roads, like education, like uh, security are all paid for by our revenue. If we don't raise enough revenue to do that, then we borrow. But even the borrowing, we must service the interest and the loans using the revenue. Okay. So yes, every Ugandan has a reason to contribute tax, because without tax, we cannot expect goods and services from government. Thank you very much. I think that is very clear. <coughs> Coming to you, Mr. Kisirinya. Now that we know that the roads that we would want to move on to sell our goods and services, provide our services, are constructed based on how much we have been able to contribute at least as, as a country. The question is, why does there seem to be this level of non-compliance, like, like you are clearly stated, the revenues are growing, the tax to GDP doesn't seem to be growing because some of the businesses are still informal. Why do we still have a lot of these businesses locked in informality out of uh, the research that you have done? 
Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, and I must commend government for the investments that are being made in infrastructure. I think it is really pleasing. Mm -hmm. And it is also pleasing to note that, uh, like for instance, last year, our ease of doing business improved to 116 out of 190 countries because we were able to have more power available for our manufacturers and businesses in Uganda. I think that is a very commendable uh, thing that government is doing. But having said that, uh, we need to look at how we efficiently run these investment projects. For instance, uh, we know for sure, uh, uh, and the Minister of uh, Finance has reported, that only about 40% of investment projects, r r roads, dams, uh, all these infrastructure projects are actually completed within time and budget. Others extend uh, in, in, in the time they require to complete them. Uh, the, there, is, there are infrastructure projects we know that have actually utilized double the time for which they actually they were was set up to be completed. This creates inefficiencies and creates a lot of cost to the taxpayer to actually complete these uh, investment projects. And uh, no wonder, uh, we know very well for sure that uh, our service delivery index is one of the lowest in East Africa as Uganda. So we need to improve these things so that when the um, taxpayers see value that is coming out of the, of the taxes they pay, they will actually contribute more. But having said that, we also know very well that there is a, a lot of leakage uh, in the taxes, and uh, one of the biggest routes is the, the avoidance and the um, uh, non-payment of tax, most especially by uh, businesses that are not registered, that Masse doesn't know about. Mm. There are many out there that <coughs> are not actually registered. Now. We need to appreciate and work together, government, private sector, and all Ugandans, and appreciate why don't businesses want to be formal? Mm -hmm. Why don't we want to be formal? Is it because when I become formal, whatever I want to do, I must go to URSB to get a stamp and, they, and I pay? Is it because of the very many things that you have got to do when you become formal? I was very... Uh, impressed when the Commissioner General uh, has now uh, put it that open your business will not come for you until you have started making the money. But one of the biggest complaints that we've had from people who are starting up new business, especially young people, is that we convince them out of the incubation centers, out of all of these places, they now formalize the business. The moment the fellow gets a teen, not even a year passes, and there are all these requests for filing returns, filing returns. So the field actually gets confused and now wonders whether actually by becoming formal, they opened the door to <laughs> all these kinds of requirements. So what okay. the, the, the commissioner has said is the way to go. The business should not be taxed until it makes money. And this can be done. This is when businesses will be in a position to, to record, because by recording they are able to prove that they are not making money, and then they are not being taxed. This must happen in reality, and that will help. That is one of the ways in which we are going to motivate. So they've been the fearing you sector. are a knocking on the door, probably. <laughs> that's why they don't formalize. Yeah, that's that's why they, they, they have a big problem. And actually, today they, they don't even have to come to your to your door. They actually, your email they will, <laughs> will be all of the time. There is, I think I receive more emails from URA <laughs> as PSFU than from one single source. But I think that is a very good thing because it shows that tax administration is strong, mm. which I commend the commissioner for. Mm. But let's make sure that we nurture the businesses before we can uh, request them to start contributing. That is something that will help with the formalization. That is very, very important. Secondly, we need to improve our business development services that we deliver to the businesses that we begin. Business development services are all those things that we can work or go with you to ensure that you are able to run your business professionally. You record your transactions. <coughs> you are able to comply with the legal and regulatory requirements like standards. 
um, you are able to, to work and use uh, money like for instance from loans or from other investors. So these are the things that, we, that people need to know. So we need to have those programs that empower people who start businesses to ensure that they are able to run professionally, make money, and then they can get into, into the, 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 the tax system. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Kisirinya. I know that uh, Matthew, Kenu, I mean Masi, um, is, is, is burning to add up something, especially with regard to URSB's contribution to formalization, but uh, Ms. Kenu, we show that will be shortly when we do return from this short commercial break. We are due for a break, let's take it. And when we do return, we continue looking at the business environment and the ease of doing business in Uganda. How do we make it better and all also achieve that financial independence, economic independence as a country when we do return. The business sector goes well under the spotlight. Are you the business person fighting to stay ahead of your competition or the one looking to advance the Ugandan dream? From innovation to technology, taxation, economic booms and more. Join Mildred Tuhaise as she hosts John Rujochi Musinguzi, Commissioner General of the Uganda Revenue Authority, URA, Masi Keinowisho, Registrar General of the Uganda Registration Services Bureau, URSB, under the theme, Accountability of the Realities, Exploration of the Opportunities. This Monday, 26th April, 2021 on Spotlight UG. Spotlight UG, Mondays at 10 p.m. live on UBC Television. should stop you from finishing what's yours. That's why MTN gives you data bundles that don't expire. Load MTN Freedom Bundles using my MTN app and enjoy the freedom to finish your data bundles. MTN. What does it mean to be closer together? It's taking the last bus home for a surprise visit. Closer together is strangers finding a connection. It's bringing home something much more than a box. It's the warmth of home or the beginning of something new. There's magic in sharing the things that we love. Because it's those things that bring us close together. Today tastes like a new tradition. Like an old favorite. Tastes like all hands on deck and all eyes on the prize. Today tastes like a piece of the action. And it never tasted this good. 2020 was the year the tourism sector got disconnected. But this year, we reconnect. To leads, growth, to industry experts, to wider markets, to untapped potential. Be part of the first ever virtual Pearl of Africa Tourism Expo and engage with industry experts from around the world. Find out how you can grow your leads, put your tourism business back on the map and a whole lot more. Sign up for free at www.poate.co.ug slash register and reconnect with your world. The Pearl of Africa Tourism Tourism Expo runs from the 27th to the 29th of April 2021 and is proudly brought to you by Uganda Tourism Board. It's no secret that ICT makes learning easy. 
the strides made in our field could not be possible without it. And now we can watch our favorite show. Ah, my radio is my best friend. UCC provides an enabling regulatory environment and policy guidance for healthy competition. We also facilitate ease of doing business in the communications sector through licensing, standardization, spectrum management, tariff regulation, rural communication development and consumer empowerment. An informed consumer is an empowered consumer. UCC supports local content and innovations. Driving the development of a robust communication sector in Uganda is Uganda Communications Commission. COVID-19, if we get vaccinated now, observe social distancing, wear masks properly, sanitize or wash our hands with soap and water regularly. Together we can defeat this enemy. Today tastes like a new tradition, like an old favorite. Tastes like all hands on deck and all eyes on the prize. Today tastes like a piece of the action. And it never tasted this good. business sector goes well under the spotlight. Are you the business person fighting to stay ahead of your competition or the one looking to advance the Ugandan dream? From innovation to technology, taxation, economic booms and more. Join Mildred to Haise as she hosts John um, Ujochi Musinguzi, Commissioner General of the Uganda Revenue Authority, URA. Of Masuki. paying the taxes. That way we will be able to get the services and it also gives you the audacity to ask and request and demand that your taxes or the monies that you get to pay uh, work. The hashtag is Spotlight UG for any questions that are coming through and uh, we will of course be sharing some of your questions and still with us in uh, the house at uh, the next conference center is the Uganda Registration Services Bureau. We do have uh, the Registrar General, um, um, Ms. Masika Inowisho. We also do have the Commissioner General of the Uganda Revenue Authority with us at the NCC. And we also have uh, the Deputy Executive Director of the Private Sector Foundation discussing how we can better the environment for doing business and that we will be able to meet our obligations as a whole. As we took a break we were talking about the formalization process some of the reasons uh, that many of these businesses are still operating informally and hiding through and um, uh, to you Ms. Kinowisho the question is the contribution of Uganda Registration Services Bureau to formalization the formalization process entirely through which then URA comes in to pick up the taxes later. Thank you uh, Mildred and the Ugandan economy is uh, private sector led and this uh, means that uh, uh, it is the small medium uh, sector or enterprises that run the show in as far as the economy is concerned. Uganda has a population of 43 million uh, people. And still growing. And still growing mm. by 1.2 million every year. But with COVID-19 pandemic babies, it may go to 1.5 million. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when you look at the register that URSB has, it has less than 1 million registered businesses. And to be specific, it is 800,000 registered businesses when you look at the economies uh, or the cities that you come from, the local governments that you come from, 
everybody is operating a business. It is uh, stated that every two out of 10 Ugandans are running a business. And this is a report that came out in 2017, 2018. And we have also been uh, rated as the most entrepreneurial country. Mm -hmm. The women of Uganda are also rated as the most entrepreneurial women in the world. So that means that doing business or starting business is our culture, is part of our culture as Ugandan. So we have that leverage. It's one thing to start a business and it is another to formalize it. We, as Uganda Registration Services Bureau, our target is to move the informal sector to the formal sector. Because if these businesses are not known by the state, it is very hard to plan for them. Mm -hmm. If these businesses are not registered, they are not validly are recognized, they cannot access credit, there is no bank that will give a loan or extend credit facilities to an unregistered entity. If you want to trade within the country and be competitive, you must be registered. Your brands must be registered. Your patents must be registered. If you want to acquire land or acquire property as an entity which has which is a, a legal person uh, under the law, you have to be registered. If you want to trade across borders under the common markets protocol of East Africa that provides for free movement of goods, services, you must be registered. And so Uganda Registration Services Bureau is very vital in this whole process. And to register your business or to start your business, you must start with Uganda Registration Services Bureau. Whether you are an investor in Uganda, a local or in, uh, a foreign investor, the starting point is URSB mm. for formalization. And the registration takes different phases. There's application for registration of your name there's a search and examination of the registrar to give you a go ahead on where the name can go through so it doesn't cause confusion in the market space. Then you pay the registration fee through the banks that are within our one-stop center or through mobile money or using Visa. They're all payment models available. Then once the payment has been done mm. with regard to registration uh, fees and stamp duty. Then we give you a certificate within three to four hours. It is as easy as that. Okay. But so what after registration? We have the pre-registration requirements, then the registration requirements, but also the post-registration services. And this is where we have collaborative engagements with a URA because when you register with us, we have a one-stop shop, a one-stop model where you register your business for a tax identification number, you register your business for NSSF. If you're in a local government, you get the trading license through the Ministry of Local Government uh, station in our office. If it is the capital city, Kampala capital city, you get from the KCCA station, this is within the one-stop shop at URSB. If you want to procure land, to purchase land, there's Ministry of Lands. If you want to get the national identification, you have to, there's NIRA represented in the one-stop shop that has over 10 ministries, departments, and agencies. And because we cannot register you without identifying yourself, we have integrated our data with the NIRA uh, system, with the URS system, and with the NSSF systems to enable registration. And so we have simplified the registration processes. You can apply online, you can apply by mail, you can, we have even modified the processes, the steps it takes to register business because the key determinants of the cost of doing business in every economy at the time it takes to register business, and I said it is three hours to four hours, the cost 
of doing business. This is the time, I mean, the, how much you pay, uh, moving up and down, the cost uh, as in, in transport, do you have to come to Kampala to register? And this has been enabled through the online registration, but also being in the different regional offices uh, and centers. Why does the centers. feeling still remain among some Ugandans that the process is tedious to register a business? Um, um, one of the reasons is uh, that uh, this may be attributed to uh, the level of lack of information okay. by the clients, and we continue to communicate, communicate as much as possible. Uh, the reason we are also here at NBS, not everybody will appreciate the information. But also we have a culture of not embracing some of the We are used to using middle men, middle women. Okay. And we have also created, we have given them a lot of power that they give us misinformation. They make it difficult, them a lot of power that they give us misinformation. They make it difficult, seem difficult for them to uh, make it, that's a, a side hustle, their business. The other is the processes that have been enabled. We used to receive memorandum and articles of association that are beyond 30 pages, 20 pages. But now we modified the memorandum and articles of association to be just one, two pages. And this is to simplify because the company's act already has a, a model of uh, the tables that are required, the objects closed, everything is already embedded in the act. So there was a lot of duplicity. But also when it comes to the cost of maintenance of data on behalf of the state, it is very expensive to keep this data. We are a data center. We have a register, an electronic document management system of all registered entities. But when you are to store all these pages, every company that applies has over 100 pages. And if a company is a busy company, you find it has 100, 1 million pages and all these have to be stored. So we said, no, we have to amend and modify this. And along the way also uh, came up with a draft model document which has not been embraced yet okay. which involves a ura for the teen number registration application for registration nssf under the tax uh, uh, payer register expansion project so that when somebody submits an application with ursb all this information is captured at the entry point including the nin the national identification number and so when ura wants to uh, give a TIN number, they may not have to get this information again from the same client. They'll pick from the database of URSB to use that for the TIN number. Okay. NSSF, a uh, 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 one-stop model, or uh, online model, in addition to the physical one-stop shop. So the processes have been simplified. The cost has been addressed. The coverage has been addressed and enabled by the online system, but also being uh, having one-stop shops around the country. We have 44 centers under the Tax Register Expansion Project. We are in many regions uh, 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 as URSB, URA is all over across the borders. And so we have made a lot of effort in terms of coverage so that we are accessible to uh, the uh, public or the citizens or the uh, investors, be it local or foreigners. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Msinguzi, the question that runs through the mind of anyone who is planning on doing a business or already doing is, what do I lose if I don't formalize? Or what do I gain in um, the formalization process? Mm. Because many are thinking, after all, you're going to start sending us the mails mm. and knocking on the door and asking for tax returns at the end of the day. Uh, thank you, Mildred. <clears throat> um, I like the comment uh, from... Uh, my sister Marcy, uh, the, the formalization of business is really primarily for the benefit of the business itself. <clears throat> now, if a business is to grow from one level to another, for its own benefit, it needs to have some proper records. What was the investment made when you're opening up? What are your expenses? What is your income? What is your profit? And so on and so forth. Now, the information gap that exists between 
uh, agencies like myself, uh, agencies like uh, my colleagues and myself, where, where we come from, and our clients is so big that sometimes that information gap complicates their business and our business. I'll take the example of uh, the comment that was earlier made by Francis, that young people uh, they are complaining fear. about you. Yes, they fear you are a, they think that once you get a teen, you must start paying business. Mm. Absolutely not true. The reason we want you to get a teen at the beginning of your business is for us to have a record that yes, today John has opened a company. This company has no tax obligation at all. We'll give it a tax identification number, the teen. But it has no tax obligation at all until it has started earning an income. And an income is not equal to a sale. It's not that once you start selling and getting some cash, it means you have an income. No. An income will only be after you have made your sale, taken off your expenses, and you stay with a profit. So it is profit that is considered as income. Okay. And tax will not take your entire profit. It will take only 30% of your net profit. So a company that has registered has no tax obligation at all until it has started earning a profit. The only obligation that that company has is to file a return. Now, what does filing a return mean? That's the word that is scaring the, the young businesses. Mm -hmm. Filing a return is sharing this information of your income, your expenses. That's the word they call return. It is your income, your expenses, and your profit. Sharing that record of your income, expenses, and profit. And declaring, should there be a profit declaring a percentage of tax, 30% of that profit as your tax? If there is no income, you file what they call a new return. It points to the fact that, yes, I had sales, I had expenses, my expenses were equal to my sales, and I had no profit to declare. And therefore, I filed a new return. There are businesses that have been filing new returns for 10 years, some for 20. Whether that is are you true able or not. Whether to dig, exactly, that was my question. Are you able to dig in deeper on whether <clears throat> I am filing the, the truth or I am I'm coming to that running mirror. away? Yes. That may be true because some businesses take long, mm. but also some of that has been abused. People okay. declare information that is not true. So now for starters, the young businesses, they will be declaring the truth. Because businesses don't easily pick up. Yeah. So let them feel free. Now, that's the first gap that I see. Tax education. Mm -hmm. On the side of Masse, registration of companies, education. So that people can start to know that really relating with URSB and URA at the beginning of my business is not to my detriment. It is to my advantage. Because these guys will not take what does not belong to them. Okay. So that is one. The other gap that I see on our side, maybe is to try and ease our processes. Because you see, we are using filing of returns. Mm -hmm. And maybe whether, whether a return can be filed over a telephone, or it needs you to get a computer, or it needs you to hire a tax expert, is another thing that points to a process. But what we've done at URA, for example, we are cognizant that some businesses may not find it easy to keep records, and that is acceptable. I have a small shop in my trading center. Mm. I make sales, I make profit, I go and do shopping, and at the end of the year, yes, I can buy a piece of land or buy a cow or buy an additional acre of land for growing my crops, 
Yes, there is sign that I have an income and there is progress. Even for that kind of business, without proper records, you can also contribute your fair share of tax. There is what we call presumptive tax. Presumptive tax is for those businesses that may not be in position to keep records and file returns, but who can make an estimate? He will say, at the end of the year, I have made sales of about 20 million, and we have bands of presumptive tax. So we say, OK, if at the end of the year you've made sales of 20 million, maybe between uh, 20 and 50, and you're in a small trading town, just contribute 100,000 towards government <clears throat> as your tax contribution, as simple as that. Maybe if you're making sales between 50 and 100 million, contribute 300,000, and so on and so forth. So we, what, maybe let me quickly move to what we are doing to address those gaps. Because sure, I've told you sure. at the start, mm. we are now deliberate. We know that for us to develop our country, we will not do it with a few taxpayers. Mm. When Masi was submitting, she says she has 800,000 registered companies. You should ask me how many of these companies are actively paying tax about maybe 150, less, much, much less. But I also know from practice that many people register companies and don't actually go on to make business with those companies. Okay. Maybe most of us in this room have some dormant companies. Mm -hmm. So why is it important to keep record with Massey and keep record with URA, even if it's for any return? we will know that on this date, a company was registered. But after one year, this company has made no profit and it has filed a new return. And second year. And then the third year, when it peaks and it starts making an income, it will declare an income. So there will be visibility of company X registered today, where is it tomorrow and next year and the other year. And if it starts contributing tax, there will also be visibility. It started small, it has grown to medium, and now it's large. The companies you see here today, the multinationals, started small. Shell, uh, Game, they are not indigenous companies. They have where they started. Somewhere in France, a small company started. They kept record. They grew from one step to another. They expanded into Europe. They've come in Africa, Asia, everywhere. That is to the benefit of the business. Proper record keeping, growth, and of course meeting the obligation of tax. I, I, I think uh, next, uh, this company, next, uh, next, media, uh, service. next media Services, mm -hmm. is one of the good example of indigenous companies. Mr. Karisa started when it was a small company. We've seen it grow. I don't know whether now you've extended into other countries. But there is hope that for a company that starts small and grows and keeps proper record and meets its obligation, one day it will expand into the region and into Africa and beyond. So that is really the whole reason why companies should keep records, should make their tax obligation, because there is chance that you can find partners, you can grow from one level to another. Okay. Now, very quickly, at Uganda Revenue Authority, we are deliberately going to invest in tax education. Let people not run away from us. We've become scarecrows. <laughs> they have nothing to fear, but yet they run. Okay. Register with us and keep in touch with us. File the true returns, we will not harass you. Mm. Now, the other category that files wrong returns, there is a solution for them. We are automating our processes. Okay. Now, there is information enough to tell us what every business does, but we have not been utilizing this information. And maybe now I should take the opportunity to kind of give uh, some good alert, twist or blow to our taxpayers, that this is the time to start telling URA the truth. Because, because very soon we'll find out. Okay. And when we find out, you have to pay more than what you should have paid okay. if you voluntarily disclosed. So we are automating our processes and we are sharing a lot of information 
with uh, other parties, third party information, and we're analyzing that information, and it's bringing up amazing uh, information to us. Remember, if, as an example, you make a sale and you don't declare it, you say, okay, I'm wise, URI is not watching. But the person who has paid you this money, when he was paying you, there was a VAT input in the money they paid you. So when they are filing their return, they will show me I paid this company and there was an element of VAT. And at that point, I will ask you, can you amend your return? When you filed this return, you did not indicate this income. Or I will come for it. And of course, once an audit is done, you don't only pay your taxes, but you also are penalized for that kind of gap. Okay. So as we get to leverage technology and a lot of information that we have, we'll be able to make more informed decisions, we'll be able to make more accurate assessments, and that is where we are going as an organization. Okay. But you're also aware that we have a number of smart technologies that we are putting in place. One of them is uh, the digital tracking solution for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for every bottle of water that you drink, <coughs> excuse me, you can always look out for, for the digital stamp. This, this number here is evidence that the water in here is pure and good. It, it has come from a genuine factory, but it has also paid its tax. So for everybody enjoying a bottle of water that has paid tax, you are not only contributing to nation development, you are also guaranteeing the security and your safety. So these smart initiatives like digital tracking solution, like IFRIS, you've heard about electronic, physical, receipting, and invoicing uh, system. That is one that keeps us up to date on real time about uh, the sales that you're making in your business. And uh, we are just loading it out. A number of people are not yet on board. So okay. all these really will contribute to more accurate and clear information. And uh, it will work for the benefit of the taxpayer, but also for the benefit of revenue collection. We should get more accurate. All right. Thank you very much. We'll be coming back to you. <coughs> Mr. Xerinya, on the aspect of tax education, where is the missing link? Yeah, I think uh, uh, very clearly as, uh, as come out in this discussion, the, there is some information gap. Uh, I wouldn't want to say whether there could be also some trust gap of some sort. Hmm. All taxpayers need to be to see examples of people who are complying with the taxes, people who are um, uh, in, uh, formal. What, are, what benefits they actually get out of this. Now, the, there is a discussion, uh, and uh, I encourage uh, my colleagues uh, on the panel to get interested, that seems to imply that we can create some intermediate uh, organizations, like associations, where those companies or those business people that don't feel comfortable yet to get to URSB, to formal register, or get to URA can first organize themselves. And then afterwards, they are organized, grown, and then now they can be passed on to URSB and can be passed on to URA. Uh, for instance, we know very well that um, there are uh, cooperative groups uh, at village level, at Gombola level, which actually register, and they, they are formal, but they don't actually uh, not registering with URSB. They are registering with their local governments. They are registering with the, uh, some other organizations. Now, you could have something that is similar uh, to come through and uh, bring in these people, incubate them, so to say, first of all, and then you can now let them go to uh, URSB and URA. That could be one of the things we could think about in terms of uh, uh, reaching out to more people to come and register. But having said that, it is very, 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 very important for whoever is doing business to comply 
with the, the national laws that are there at the moment. Let us register our businesses. Let us pay taxes. Otherwise, it's not possible at all for us to run our country. And we are not always going to be uh, operating under the radar. If you are operating under the radar, there are so many things that you are, not, you are not going to benefit from. You can't grow your businesses, your business, because your bank doesn't see you. Just imagine you have operated informally for the last 10 years. All, all of that history, you actually don't have it anywhere. You cannot say, URSB does not have any of your records. If you are looking, you are fundraising for money, you are looking for partners, you are looking for uh, tenders, for instance, that are being are floated in the government under the new arrangements that government has established, like uh, under BUBU, like uh, the preference schemes that are now where local providers access um, business from government, you cannot because you are not registered, because you are not paying taxes. Okay. So it is important for us as business people, wherever we are, to do our best to register and also to pay taxes. As new or as other reforms get to be instituted which can uh, help uh, create that middle level which can help us graduate to the level we want. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Kenobisho, the aspect of credit remains a very key factor in enabling businesses, whether it is just startup or its continuity of, uh, of business. And um, it becomes a little hard for many businesses. But you earlier on talked about um, uh, the use of movable assets as collateral, and you talked about the simple, the security interest in movable uh, property, which was launched, I think, in 2020. Let, let's speak to that. How can a business, how can an individual operating a business be able to use this? Thank you, Mildred. The Security in Movable Property Act of uh, 2019 uh, provides uh, a mechanism of using your movable property that is collateral as uh, uh, movable property chattels as collateral to access uh, funds. Or can I just have the mic point up a little bit? Yes. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Mm. The, the Security in Movable Property Act of 2019 that was launched by the President uh, uh, through the system of SIMPO in 2020 September does provide for a platform or a mechanism of using your movable property, which is uh, which are chattels, as collateral to access a loan from lenders and lenders here within the financial institutions. Traditionally, we are used to relying on fixed assets. People ask for a land title, the banks will ask for a land title if they want to give you a loan. But this law enables you to use your crops. Uh, uh, my brother John was talking about agriculture sector your crops, not land, the crops, mm. the trees, mm. because they have value. Your, your watch, your jewelry, your computer, and all these uh, movable assets. And the beauty about that law is that it introduces the use of intellectual property as well as collateral, which is a new <coughs> shift. It's a, a new business model that is not, and what we have done as an institution is we've been engaging the stakeholders on adaptability, on embracing the use of movable property as collateral. I may have my cows, my goats. I'll use them as collateral. My chairs, my, my fridge, my anything that has value and can move. And this enables access to credit in as far as the bigger population that may not have fixed property but may have movable property or intangible property. And majority of these are youth and women. A woman will have their plantation or their jewelry, their other movable assets, and would want to get a loan maybe to pay school fees <coughs> for their children. This young person at the university may want to pay their school fees for the last semester, and they have a laptop, they have some assets, so when they present the collateral registration, 
that has been certified by URSB to the financial, financial institutions, they should be in position to access the finances. The only uh, challenge comes in on valuation of this property. Mm -hmm. The banks have to value how much your cows weigh, how the, the value in your pine trees, in your plantation, your matoke, if you're envisaging, uh, the, if you're predicting, or you have a presumption that you're going to get around 100 bunches from the banana plantation by the end of uh, three months, the banks should, be, should enable you to get a, a loan to help you take your crops to the marketplace. In that valuation process, where is me, the person who is trying to get the loan? using my movable property? Yes, um, uh, basically what we do as Uganda Registration Services Bureau, we register you, if it is a car, if it is a car, you have a logbook, we register you into the simple system. And if the banks are going to rely on the logbook of Mildred, they have to check our system, who is the registered proprietor and how much loan or credit have they got on that uh, uh, a logbook. Mm -hmm. if, it, if your car is valued at 30 million and you've got 15 million from one financial institution, well and good. But you can also use the same to get another 15 million to, from another bank because the value of still that uh, property is still uh, valid. So uh, basically, uh, for us as an institution, uh, we have gone ahead to register, we have sensitized banks, we have sensitized all stakeholders, and we continue. So and do I, I as a business, sorry for, to interrupt you, do I as a business come in right now and, and register with URSB <coughs> all my movable properties? Yes. So just in case I need to use them, it is easy for the financial institutions too? True. It must be registered with Uganda Registration Service, Services Bureau. Mm -hmm. It is a precondition to the bank's relying on it because we are the ones with the mandate to uh, register that. And it's a new system. Okay. It's a new system that we're trying to promote because we know that we can only enable access to credit by using the movable property, which is the majority. Your business may be falling. Uh, you want to, be, uh, to rescue and, or recapitalize it, and yet you have a fleet of cars you have a fleet, uh, a fleet of cars, you have computers, you have all these, even intellectual property, you want to launch your album or, 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 and, and you don't have any money for, for, for promoting uh, your, 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 your launch. So the banks can rely on the information of you who is registered in our system in the simple, in the security in movable, in, in, in interest in movable property system to get you a loan. So you qualify to use uh, your movable property after registering with URSB system of the simple. But you know, URSB has the business register, the intellectual property register, the civil registration register, but also the simple register. Okay. So you as a company who, that owns property, you are advised that if you want to use that property to access loans, you have to again register it with URSB within the simple uh, system. And it doesn't mean that you take your cows uh, to URSB or you bring <laughs> your fleet of cows to URSB. No, as long as there's evidence of ownership uh, there, you'll be enabled to access credit. Thank and it's you. a good system. It's a good system that has changed. We want to encourage financial institutions or lenders to use it. We have been used to uh, money lenders with all due respect. I'm not trying to undermine them. They've done a lot of work. But it is, it is unstructured. The money lending system that has been on board has been unstructured. That somebody will take your logbook and a sign transfer. If you don't pay that amount of money within a specific period, they will take your property. All they'll switch off their phones and mm. disappear mm. and mm. they take it. So we are trying to mitigate all those risks in our society to enable an environment that has a, a good infrastructure for access to credit for uh, because many of us many businesses thrive on credit there are very few businesses 
that do not have the benches or that do not have uh, loans uh, from, from uh, financial institutions. So we encourage the users of our services to utilize that product from URSB. Thank you very much. And this I'll come to um, Mr. Xirinya. Mm -hmm. Simple, how do you welcome it as the private sector? But also on the aspect of access to credit comes in government domestic borrowing, which at the end of the day crowds out the private sector. How can we better this situation? at the end of the day, because government needs the money. First of all, we really welcome the movable asset register that uh, uh, URSB has actually told us about. It's been there for some time. We think it is a major reform and we welcome it as private sector foundation. To start with, it will improve on access to finance because certainly many uh, would-be borrowers have not been able to borrow because they don't have that land title. You know, it's just a very few number of people in Uganda that have land titles. Now, if you are able to have some other asset that you can pledge to a banking institution, I think that helps in terms of access to finance and we are quite happy about it. Now, so to say, access to finance is becoming better and better as we move on. But one of the things that we, is really continuing to be a problem is the cost of that finance. Yes, it is true, we've actually seen uh, some reduction in uh, interest rates uh, recently. I know some banks are now even offering uh, uh, finance at about probably 17%. This is a major, major development and good progress. But perhaps we could still achieve better interest rates. For sure, I will tell you that um, our members, for instance, in the agricultural sector, have, have told us that for them to work with financing that is beyond 8%, 10% is really not possible. They can't make it. Manufacturers, they can't make it at, uh, if it goes beyond 12% and is not long-term credit. So these remain teething challenges that we do have to work on and deal with the country. Along with that though, unfortunately, we are seeing, and because of COVID and so on and so forth, we are seeing some continued competition for the resources that are actually available within the banking system because government has got all these demands and has got to raise money to meet the demands that, that, that have come. So meaning that the more government is borrowing, the more the interest rates are, are not going to come to the level that we actually need. But we are also not doing a lot of work in trying to raise more savings into the banking sector mm. and particularly long-term savings you are aware that uh, there, is, uh, there are reforms that uh, we expected, uh, for instance, in the NSSF amendment bill. Parliament has already uh, passed the bill, but the process of uh, um, assenting it is, is taking long. And uh, in the end, what we will have is that we will have a delay in uh, people contributing to their social security uh, so that when they become older, they are able to live a better life than uh, other people. So we really need to move very quickly uh, in terms of doing the reforms. Make sure that we have more long-term finance so that it can be used in the, for the time being before the owners come for it. It can be used to support businesses. But also when these people become older, then they have something. You can't imagine, let me tell you uh, one uh, fact which is uh, we, we must actually look at. Uh, some statistics which we have from the National Business Register that was done some years ago. We know for sure that they are, of every 100 companies that uh, are registered at uh, URSB, have less than five employees. It's only seven that have more than five, more than five employees. They're the ones who, that contribute to, to social security. The others, what, what an injustice in this country. Mm. There are people who are working in companies that are small, that are employing less than five people. They don't have any contribution for social security. They can only do it now voluntarily. Nothing is mandatory. So many people are going to have very difficult uh, uh, retirement lives because they didn't have savings. So we really need to move the two things. Build long-term savings, but at the same time uh, ensure that the resources that get into the bank are not actually, uh, we are not outcompeted, we are not crowded out 
uh, by government which it has to borrow uh, to finance its expenses. Okay. Perhaps they can think of borrowing outside or even make this borrowing. They can create a market so that people who have small money can lend to government and also get the Profit interest. Out of it. But before, but right now it is not like that. All right. No. Um, looking at my time and the discussion seems to almost just be started right now. But um, coming to you, CJ, you are moving into, as you are a, into a step of, of becoming a business enabler other than just the tax collector. You've been, um, talked about IFRIS earlier on, the digital tracking solution, voluntary disclosure that is coming through, and someone out there is thinking, aren't you just become setting a trap for us so that we get to use this and at the end of the day get the monies? Why are you choosing the business enablement side? That's one. And secondly, also, on one of your mandates, uh, you, a, a, apart from just collecting and assessing and um, administering of uh, specific tax revenues, you have the duty to advise the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development on revenue implications, tax administration, and aspects of tax policies. And I'm bringing this with regard to the 30% uh, tax after I have made a profit. And some Ugandans still think this is on a higher side. How are you faring on your advisory role to Ministry of Finance? Um, thank you, Mildred. Let me start with the last question. Advisory role, yes, <clears throat> it's a big opportunity for us as URA because we collect tax, we interact with the taxpayers to feel the heat of the measures that are proposed and advise the minister. And I'm glad to inform that we are doing this. Uh, this uh, the, the, the measures that are just being presented, we've had some extensive engagement and an input uh, to the Ministry of Finance, which we appreciate. And we look forward to do this uh, even better. Of course, some of the measures need more research. So as we get ourselves ready to advise better, we are also deepening our research uh, so that uh, we can give uh, valid advice. I agree with you, the elements of things like 30% uh, income tax, it sounds to be on the higher side. Of course, some countries uh, charge more, but it's about numbers. If we can charge less, but have many more participating, then it makes sense. Because when the tax is lower, then even the incentive to avoid it uh, lessons. So we will be looking into those areas and we will uh, be doing more research and advising the ministry gladly. The, the whole, uh, the, 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 the bottom line for taxes, you cannot get better taxes from struggling businesses. So payers should know that we are shooting in the same direction. Your business grows, we get better returns in terms of tax. Now, but Mildred, since we are quickly running out of time, allow me to say a few important things mm. uh, that I would like to share with the taxpayers <clears throat> now that we have this opportunity. All right, Ian. Um, on the smart technologies you, you, you've, you've mentioned, IFRIS uh, is, is a fantastic technology. It will help the taxpayer to keep accurate records. Uh, the business of filing as we go on will be much easier and smooth because for every sale, what IFRIS does, when you're making a sale in your supermarket or in your business, that sale is sent to our URA servers and it is physicalized, then it returns to you in real time. The, the person paying will not realize. So that means we stay with a copy of that transaction and you keep your copy. Now, such uh, a record is fantastic. It means as we complete the process of automation and everything is seamless, maybe in future it will take away the need to file. So this whole baggage of files that we've been talking about, which the young people are running away from, in future with IFRIS, they may not have to need this. But it's a thing that also requires partnerships with our taxpayers. So as we roll out IFRIS, we want our taxpayers to be our partners so that when you walk into a supermarket or you go to buy your cement in a hardware shop, ask the taxpayer, I want an e-receipt. E-receipt is that physicalized receipt that has reached URA and has come back to you, meaning it has paid the tax and it doesn't increase the amount. Whether you ask for an e-receipt or you don't, 
you will pay the same amount. <clears throat> so it's an area where we want partnership. Same with the digital tracking solution. Mm -hmm. Demand for a, uh, you, you've seen Kapo trying to tell us about that. Demand for a bottle that has paid tax. It will be good for your health. And, and then, of course, we are bringing another smart technology for rentals, rental income, uh, using satellite imagery and uh, blockchain technology. We'll be able to know every property that earns an income and should contribute some, some, some taxes from that. So we'd like to ask our taxpayers to join hands with us. Now, we have established that where we are is not a comfortable place. It's not a comfortable place for the country because these taxes are for developing the country. It's not a comfortable place for the taxpayer because services will not be delivered. It is not a comfortable place, of course, for the tax collector. Our performance is not up to the mark. Mm. At 13% of tax, the, the tax to GDP, um, the, the, there is hardly a chance that the country can develop. In fact, research has shown that for a country to develop, you need to be collecting uh, somewhere between 15 and 20%. And that is why for developed nations, they are collecting over 30%. For Latin America and others, they are collecting over 25. Even in Africa, for developed nations like South Africa, Morocco, they are collecting above 25. So for Uganda to be developing at 13% of tax to GDP ratio, I think it is, first of all, an indication that our leaders are prioritizing. Whatever they are doing is what matters. That's why you can see a road being built at 13%. I think it would be much more difficult if they were focusing on spending on consumptive uh, activities, we would not be seeing any progress. So if we agree as taxpayers and tax collectors and uh, citizens who want a service that where we are is not a comfortable place, let's join hands. And one of the things we have introduced to make sure that we move in collaboration is alternative dispute resolution. We have about 600, over 600 cases in court with different taxpayers. They spend money on lawyers. We spend money on our officers going to defend ourselves. But why are we doing this? Mm. I mean, taxes are for developing the nation which we live in. And we should take pride in paying our taxes. Why should I overassess you as Uganda Revenue Authority? Why should I ask you tax that you should not be paying? Why? Even if I charge you more, I will not take home more as a salary unless if I steal it. So we are saying let's settle tax matters amicably. Okay. We sit around the table, we talk with the taxpayer, we tell him, but you know, sir, here you did not declare this sale. He says, okay, I realize I did not. I will declare it. He says, but you, office of URA, here you assumed that I had no expense. This is my receipt. We reconcile. In the last nine months, we have settled about 25 cases through that channel, alternative dispute resolution. And we have collected 212 billion from that approach. It's a win-win. The taxpayer walks out happy. He has fulfilled his obligation. He's not hiding from URA or fighting with URA in court anymore. The only maybe loser in this equation is the lawyers. But they should also, there is more work for lawyers. So don't, don't be against this approach. Okay. So I want to take this opportunity to invite the hundreds in court with us. Come and we settle. Um, Another thing that I mentioned earlier, voluntary disclosure. Mm -hmm. Now, the law has given commissioner some bit of authority that for any taxpayer who checks voluntarily and declares on their own without being prompted, I had not seen this tax, I had not declared it, even if it's for 10 years ago, he will go scotch free from penalty or interest. That's a window we should utilize okay. so that we settle our tax matters. Because the risk is, Mildred, and I want to get off in the interest of time, mm. when you wait for me to prompt, I've told you now we are doing information analysis. And it is showing amazing data. If you wait for me to prompt you and say, but Mildred, here you did not declare this income. It can no longer be 
qualifying voluntary. for voluntary disclosure. Okay. It is recovery of tax with penalty and interest. Now, finally, for us to walk this journey, we all need to approach it with clean hands. I'm asking taxpayers approach with clean hands. As URA, we are committing to walk this journey with clean hands. Okay. We are recommitting to integrity. Corruption will be zero at URA. We will do the right thing and do it transparently and efficiently to the benefit of our taxpayers. And we will do everything because it is our opportunity to serve our nation and do it patriotically and do it with commitment. So I, I want to assure taxpayers that where we are going, it will be a smooth and mutually beneficial relationship. Okay. No one will be coerced into paying what they have not earned and let's not hide from each other. Great news for the taxpayers right there. Our time is first spent, but Miss um, um, uh, Kainabwisho, before we leave, we should not live without talking about marriages. The registration, I saw somewhere filing marriage returns, and I was asking myself how that comes through. Because marriage is a business for others. We are the caterers, we are the, I mean, decorators, and uh, the people hiring out uh, car services and everything. So it's a business um, in, in, in itself as well. Let's speak about it a bit. Yes, thank you, uh, Mildred. Yes, uh, URSB's uh, mandate is uh, to register uh, marriages, uh, civil marriages, but also to receive returns from places of worship uh, that have conducted uh, marriages. These are licensed places. Uh, we should appreciate that there are different types of marriages in Uganda. We have the civil marriage, we have the Hindu marriage, we have the Muslim marriage, we have the church marriage, we have the customary Absolutely. marriage. And all these marriages are legal under the laws of Uganda. It is one thing to conduct a marriage and it is another thing for the state to know this record. So under the law, the places of worship, these are the churches that are licensed to conduct marriages, are expected to file returns and by returns, we mean that they have to file this information of the marriages they have conducted. And marriages are not weddings, weddings are ceremonies. Marriages that they have conducted with URSB. And so you, when your marriage is not on the state register, uh, it does not make it illegal, but there are many uh, things that you miss out. Uh, banks may want to verify who is your real spouse for purposes of giving you credit. But even other countries, if you want to cross, go across borders with your spouse or family, the embassies will have to verify with URSB on behalf of uh, the state. So these marriages have to be on our register. And it's very easy to conduct a, a civil marriage in addition to filing these places of worship, filing these returns as a requirement of the law. We also issue licenses. Every place that conducts a marriage must be licensed by the, by the Ministry of Justice through uh, uh, URSB. And when you see a marriage being conducted in a church that is not licensed, that marriage is void from the start. We also give special licenses if you want to conduct your marriage in a public place. And a public place here, we mean like hotels, Munyonyo, where Sheraton, you've seen pastors ceremonizing marriages in those places. It is URSB, the ministry or the government that authorizes and gives those licenses. If you conduct or any uh, pastor or any um, a religious a marriage in a place that is not licensed, there is no marriage at all. Lastly, the procedure for marriages. It's just by application for civil marriages. It's an application is made. You have to be 18 years and above. We have to have an LC letter. We have to have uh, consent from your parents, especially when you're below 21. There's need for consent between 18 and below 21. 21. We need affidavits that confirm that you have not been married before because for marriages to be valid, you must not have conducted a marriage anywhere or you must be divorced. Uh, uh, somewhere, so you must not be in a subsisting marriage. You pay around about 200,000 to, to 250, okay. and we publish 
you are now not sports, electronic not sports, all over URSB. Publishing is where the problem comes. Yes, for, for some 21 people. days. And then we give you a date of marriage. But there's also provision for dispensing with the 21 days, okay. especially when they're, you're traveling uh, very soon and there's evidence that you're moving out of the country or you're going for studies. We can dispense, the minister can dispense with those uh, 21 days. Okay. And then you, you get your civil marriage, very affordable very accessible in time. We conduct close to 12 marriages on a day, between 10 to 12 marriages every day. Marriage, and I don't think there's any place of worship that and divorces? handles that. No, uh, the law does not permit us to uh, register divorces, Divorce. uh, apart from the uh, law that uh, relates to the Mohammedan, the, the, the Muslim uh, uh, marriages, because it is self-contained. Uh, and that one, you register the marriages, but also <coughs> the talaq, tal talaqs, the, 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 the divorces. Okay. But for Christian marriages, we do not uh, hold the register of divorces. But when you declare yourself in the forms, application forms, as a divorcee, we need evidence of the decree absolute, which confirms that you are a divorcee and you are eligible for another marriage. So the information on divorces is in the courts. But now we are trying to work with the courts to integrate our data uh, to see when Mildred comes to get married, there will be data about your, your history of relationship mm. in, in as far as marriages are concerned. Okay. Thank you. Your final remarks in just a minute as we get out. Thank you very much. Um, the business environment moves economies. And we all have a role to play as institutions that facilitate business registration. We must address the bottlenecks, and I'm glad that we have addressed them by putting in place ICT infrastructure. You had the systems that are in place by making our services accessible, by putting in place one-stop shop models, by the coverage within our countries, within the, 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 the local governments and be, be beyond, by enabling the uh, the institutional framework, the institutions that are mandated to register uh, or start uh, these businesses, we have to take interest in the indicators that are provided by the World Bank and our performance in as far as uh, the decision in uh, investment decisions are concerned under the World Bank models or methodology. Uh, we need to embrace the cooperation, the communication, the coordination among the uh, MDS that uh, affect the business facilitation and I want to thank our viewers and our partners especially URA we enjoy a, a, a very good relationship with URA because we integrated we are sometimes we are like one organization okay. working together because the information they have is the information we have and together through these model projects uh, the, the tax register expansion projects to, with uh, uh, support in as far as tax education registration education is concerned we need to move out there to the public and inform give as much as information uh, that is needed by the public, but also simplify it for the ordinary person That's to address. Good. Thank you very much. Simplification, Mr. Kisirinya, over to you for your concluding remarks. Yeah, yeah. thanks very much. First of all, thank you and uh, uh, NBS for this particular program, and thank uh, my colleagues on the panel. Uh, just to emphasize that uh, for us as private sector foundation, we are convinced that partnerships is the way to go, we need to continue engaging and working together with the government agencies and ourselves so that we are able to create and implement solutions that uh, will drive our country to the next level. It's very clear the things that we have worked on together with the government, how successful they are. One of them is uh, the URSB. We really participated in the reform and also in the implementation. Uh, we've also participated in reforms that are happening in the Ministry of Lands and so many other reforms in the, the Lego and regulatory framework. And the returns we are seeing are actually uh, massive. So we encourage continued partnership uh, between uh, the government and ourselves. Thank you very much. All right. And um, CG, I'll give you a minute as well to give Thank concluding you concluding Thank you, Mildred, first of all, for moderating this debate very well, and my colleague panelists for the 
discussions and our listeners really for braving the night to listen to some of the discussion we had here. Now, in conclusion, Mildred, I want to take this opportunity to thank our taxpayers for the great uh, contribution they've made over the years. Um, I want to thank uh, all those who have, on their own, contributed their fair share of tax. I also want to take this opportunity to encourage those who have not been paying tax, that this is time when we need to join hands to build our nation, and I appeal to all of you to come on board. Now, sometime last year, when we were having a discussion with PSFU, organized PSFU for the small and medium enterprises, uh, I made reference to a scripture in the Bible, which was confirmation that even God approves of tax. You can read it at your own time. It's found in the Gospel of Mark, uh, the 12th chapter, from verse 13 uh, up to about 17. They asked Jesus, is it right to pay tax? And these are friends, these are people who are really not friends, but because they had a common interest, they came together. And they said, is it really right to pay tax? Uh, and he picked a coin and he said, okay, what face is here? Uh, and they said Caesar. So he said, okay, pay to Caesar what, what belongs, belongs to Caesar, Caesar and to God what belongs to God. The essence of that scripture is that when God gives us money, in our businesses. This money is clearly marked for three different envelopes, and we are safe if we want to prosper to keep the envelopes separate. There is money for God, there is money for your business, and there is money for, your, for taxes, for government. If you want to prosper, separate, keep those envelopes separate, don't mix. <laughs> so let's uh, agree to join hands. Now, for those who may not uh, comply to these appeals we are making, uh, all the measures of alternative settlements, of voluntary disclosure, and want to stay adamant, we are also finding a solution for them. So as I conclude, I want to share some numbers with okay. our taxpayers. To deal with, with some indiscipline on our part as tax collectors, remember we also have our own problems, yeah. which we are not shy to admit because if we don't, we will not go far. We will not build this nation. Okay. So we have set up a, a division headed by an assistant commissioner to monitor staff compliance, okay. staff discipline. Any revenue officer who continues to do things that cause revenue leakage, they will not have a comfortable stay at URA going forward. Okay. So when I asked for a note from my, because we are setting up an automated integrated service support system. We'll have free toll lines, we'll have confidential hotlines, we will have information coming by email, by WhatsApp, by all sorts of platforms integrated and efficiently managed. It is under construction. We should have this launched at the end of this financial year, okay. end of June. So we will have the hotlines, but before the hotlines come in, I've asked my staff and they will bear with me the inconvenience. I want to share their numbers with the public so that at least anyone who sees a URA officer doing something wrong, we don't wait for June, it's a long time, mm. and we need money immediately. Okay. So the gentleman who heads this compliance division is called Mr. James Abola. He's a man of integrity. We had to go head hunting for his renowned integrity in this community of ours. His number is 0772-141075. I repeat, 0772-141075. If you identify any departure from the integrity line, good customer care, things we have pledged before you, call James, and we will take collective measures. Okay. Now, if you identify a taxpayer who continues to do the other things, of hiding sales, of concealing revenue, we have another hotline headed by another lady of integrity. She's been in URA for 20 something years, and there is no taint of corruption against her record. This lady is called Jane Akelo. 
Jenna Kelo's number is 0772140387. Jenna Kelo is in charge of management of informers who give us information about tax leakage now on the side of the taxpayers. Unfortunately for this group, there is even a reward. <coughs> Anybody who brings information that leads successful tax recovery is entitled to 5% of the tax recovered. So there is an extra incentive. There is somebody who will receive this information. And these are temporary numbers. When we have automated, we will publish our hotlines everywhere. But in the meantime, let's not lose any revenue. So you okay. can call Jen Akelo or James Sabola and let's get started. Let's recover some revenue and let's bring sanity to the organization that collects. Thank you so much, Mildred for bearing with us. I think it's an indication that we needed more time. Exactly. <laughs> Please call us again. Thank you. We will definitely uh, be able to get you back. Um, there is a lot more that we needed to discuss with PSFU and URSB, but I'll just remind our viewers that you can visit the offices, physical and online offices of any of these um, organizations to get many more details um, coming through. And also, um, we will be able to continue with this discussion online using the hashtag um, Spotlight UG. Thank you so much to the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance for enabling this to come through. Thank you so much to UBC TV for also broadcasting this live and NBS television as well. And to the audience that was right here with us, I thank you so much and to all our panelists for coming through. It's been a great pleasure. May God bless you. I want to say a very good morning to you. Let's meet in the next few minutes, uh, next few hours actually, on the morning break. But like URS says, let's develop Uganda together by playing your fair share of paying the taxes. Good morning. Opportunities. This Monday, 26th April 2021 on Spotlight UG. Spotlight UG. Mondays at 10 p.m. live on UBC Television. to Women Rise Up, where we discuss women in leadership and participation in decision making in different sectors around Uganda. In preparation for your end of semester papers, your marks for the Masuro coursework are out and are on the notes board. He's not trying to fail me. He wants something from me. I know that. He's been making countless sexual remarks that I've ignored. But thank you very much, Mr. Philbert, and I hope all the other ladies.